Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, what the BC floods have left behind. From the air and from the ground, a close look at the devastating damage. All the furniture floating, all my nurseries, oh, everything is underwater. And the lives lost in that deadly mudslide. A vehicle plows into a crowded holiday parade. Dozens are injured. COVID shots for kids touch down in Canada. This is an absolutely fantastic day. How and when they'll be available. One-on-one -on -one with Adele about her new album. Everyone needs a soundtrack. You know, every, every day of life needs a soundtrack. From divorce, motherhood, her friendship with Drake, her life out of the spotlight. I do, I don't like being famous. A Canadian exclusive. Let's ask a few more questions. Let's have a few, a just a few more. I'm having a great time. This is The National. As recovery efforts gain momentum in British Columbia, there is anxiety about what the coming week might bring. There's more rain in the forecast, and that's the last thing anyone here wants. Crews have been racing to repair and shore up vital infrastructure, and there's more help from the Canadian forces on the ground and in the air. 500 troops expected to be in the province by tonight. This comes as we're learning more about the four people known to have died in this disaster when a landslide of mud and trees swept across a mountain highway. Cameron McIntosh starts our coverage tonight. After nearly a week, officials have called off the search in the mudslide near Lillooet. One man remains missing. The bodies of four other people have been recovered. Among them, Anita and Mursad Hadzik, identified by loved ones. They leave behind a two-year-old daughter. And Stephen Taylor of Calgary, a rugby player and father of three with one grandchild. The debris field is fairly extensive. Peter Bussey is mayor of Lillooet. We're doing fine despite the tragedy of epic proportion and yes. our condolences are go out to the families of these individuals. Meanwhile in Merritt, RCMP say another man last seen being washed away by floodwaters has been found safe in Kamloops. Merritt remains evacuated. The water system was contaminated and is being flushed. Homes in the floodplain are being assessed for damage tagged red, yellow or green. Those owners of red properties will unfortunately likely remain evacuated for an extended period of time. Across the region, there are 500 military. More may be sent. The federal government is also waiving COVID PCR testing for those that need to go to the U.S. to access essentials. It's also pledging to help in long-term rebuilding of damaged bridges and roads. It's not going to be good enough just to rebuild them in the way that we had done before, but we're going to have to take into, into account the, you know, the changing climate environment. Gasoline rationing will continue until the end of the month, but critical supply lines are getting fixed. Rail corridors are expected to reopen this week. Three highways have reopened to essential traffic, including Highway 7 near Merritt. We're seeing constant progress with different routes, different lanes being opened up, uh, but we're in for a very, very long recovery period. Across the region, a sense of urgency to repair and reinforce whatever flood protection remains as everyone looks to the weather and braces for more rain. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well, let's turn to Katie Nicholson now, who is in Abbotsford, where the expected rain threatens to complicate an already difficult recovery effort. What was once lush green farmland is now a lake. There were chicken farms here, but only the roofs are visible. The waters turned John Glasma's home into an island. Good thing he has a helicopter. We had to bring farmers in to uh, rescue their cows. Uh, we've had to bring uh, medical, uh, you know, cancer medication over because nobody could get over to the Chilliwack side. Everybody's been doing their part. It's true on the ground too. Working around the clock, trucks lug rocks and soil from the quarry to the Sumas Dyke. They line the road outside Shane Anderson's house. It's unreal. It's, uh, it's amazing how much uh, stuff they have to put to, to shore up the levee. Work on the dike, the only barrier between the Sumas River and the land, continues ahead of Tuesday's rain. In this waterlogged zone, there is nowhere for it to go and every millimeter counts. But the floodgates are now fully open and the Barrowtown station is pumping water into the Fraser River and away from the flood zone. 
With all this good news, we are still a long way from being out of danger. Some of the danger is obvious. Some of it is not. So stepping off the edge of the asphalt here and thinking you can walk into the farm field, that's a pretty deep drop. These waters have washed away entire seasons. Cabbages and peppers float with the current. At the end of this road, Narinder Bengal's farm. I just come here every day, sit and watch. At the end of this road, Narinder Bengal's farm. He took a boat in and peered into the windows of his home. All the furniture floating. All the shoes floating. Cars under the water. All my nurseries. Oh, everything is under the water. Everyone we spoke with today has long term solutions to prevent this kind of flooding in mind, like beefing up the Barrowtown pumping station. But for now, all eyes are on Tuesday and what that might bring. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Abbotsford. We'll have more coverage of the floods in B.C. and the recovery effort as people band together to help those most affected. Those stories a little later in the show. But now on to other news. A 71-year-old Abbotsford man has been identified as the truck driver killed in a bus crash Saturday near the Alberta border. The tractor trailer lost control on Highway 16 west of McBride, B.C. early Saturday afternoon. It then slammed into a bus that was traveling the other way. Both vehicles burst into flames. 13 other people were hurt and they were sent to hospital. Now to breaking news in the U.S. tonight. Multiple people are dead and at least 28 others hurt after an SUV ran through a holiday parade in Wisconsin. Susan Ormiston is monitoring this for us from Washington. And Susan, what do we know about what happened? Yeah, Ian, it was a holiday parade in a small city. Families were lined up to watch. We had bands, floats, dancers marching along Main Street in Waukesha. And then suddenly, tragedy. And we're getting a sense of the harrowing scene through some bystander video. So we see about 4.48 p.m. local time, a red SUV busted through barricades at one end of the parade, speeding down Main Street with no stopping. And then the city of Waukesha was live streaming the annual parade. And we see in this video with people watching that the SUV is speeding down the street perilously close to the parade. And you can hear people screaming and starting to run. To... Here's another one at street level as people watched really in horror and in shock. And then a disturbing video where from up high you can see the vehicle headed right into the parade. Now we froze it before it plowed into people marching along, mowing them down. Police say at least 11 adults and 12 children at least were taken to local hospitals. A seniors dance troupe, the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies, say members of their group were involved. Their grandmothers, a parent told us that a Milwaukee paper and told a Milwaukee paper that his daughter's dance club was hit. White pom-poms, Santa hats strewn everywhere and he had to go from body to body to find his daughter. Now a suspect is in custody. Police have the vehicle and Waukesha's police chief didn't really relieve, reveal any motive in. So let's talk about motive for a second, because as I watched some of the video earlier, there is what almost seems like a deliberateness of that uh, van or the SUV being driven. Uh, have they narrowed down possible motives at all? Well, what they'll say is they don't know if terrorism is connected. The FBI is helping with the investigation and that shots that some people heard were actually shots from a police officer trying to stop the vehicle. But we do expect tomorrow to get a lot more information on how many were killed and possibly what was happening today. All right. Susan Ormiston watching the story for us from Washington. Thank you. To Europe now, Belgium under a countrywide mask mandate and a work from home order. On the streets, that prompted protests and clashes with police. <laughs> Officers used water cannons and tear gas to disperse tens of thousands of protesters. Belgium is among several European countries seeing a sharp surge in COVID infections and in public anger.
Austria's far-right Freedom Party organized thousands of protesters against a new countrywide lockdown, which comes into effect tomorrow. Daily new cases per capita there are now roughly 25 times that of Canada. The rate in Canada is slowly rising, but there's some hopeful news tonight. Millions of pediatric doses of the Pfizer vaccine have arrived. As Matt Demore explains, that means shots for children between 5 and 11 are just around the corner. The first pediatric doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, safe and sound at Hamilton International Airport and ready to fill syringes. Really happy. This is an absolutely fantastic day. And I want to encourage all Canadians, parents, children, to get this shot. The accelerated delivery comes just days after Health Canada gave the go-ahead for emergency use. And now it's almost time for more Canadian kids to roll up their sleeves. All of the work that we've done to plan the deployment has helped us to secure 2.9 million doses, which is enough for all kids. Canada is a few weeks behind the United States, which approved the Pfizer vaccine for 5 to 11 year olds at the end of October. More than 2 million children in that country have already received a first dose. Yes, this absolutely. pediatrician in Minnesota is seeing some hesitancy from parents, but not as much as expected. Just overwhelming excitement that parents have and that actually kids have. You know, they've carried that weight of um, tension and anxiety at being unvaccinated for a long time. Montreal mom Stephanie Ventura was hesitant about the pediatric vaccine at first. Her seven-year-old son Daniel has epilepsy and she was worried about his reaction to the vaccine. But Ventura told CBC's Rosemary Barton that she consulted with her son's doctors and was convinced that the benefits outweigh any risks. Is it important to get the vaccine? Yeah. I can, you know, really see uh, the light at the end of the road um, because it's important to, to protect each other, to protect the kids. All 2.9 million doses are scheduled to arrive in Canada by the end of the week. By then, Ontario's government has said that parents will already be able to book appointments. Manitoba's rollout is set to begin within a week of delivery, and Quebec wants to provide one dose to each child by Christmas. Matt Damour, CBC News, Montreal. While vaccines continue to be the best defense against COVID, they aren't perfect. As Tally Ricci explains, the death this weekend of a fully vaccinated Ontario senator is a tragic and urgent reminder for those especially vulnerable to the virus. Ryan Hassan is happiest in a classroom. He's double vaccinated, but that doesn't mean he's completely safe. Getting COVID. Is, is a big fear. And of course, uh, Ryan is somewhat immunocompromised, right? So we do worry that the impact of it will be significant. We definitely have not taken him to a restaurant in some time. News of the death of Ontario Senator Jose Foray Nizeng following a battle with COVID-19 is underscoring the risk to vulnerable populations. Just 56 years old, her office confirmed that she had received at least two doses of a vaccine, but had an autoimmune condition affecting her lungs. It's definitely worrisome. Mandy Penny has type 2 diabetes, which leaves her at greater risk of severe illness. We're starting to feel the urgency, I think, to get those doses as quickly as possible. In Ontario, those over 70, healthcare workers, essential caregivers, and some immunocompromised people are among the groups eligible for a third dose. But some experts say there are still vulnerable people at risk. Not only are dialysis patients at, uh, immunosuppressed, so they're at high risk of getting COVID, uh, B, they are forced to come to the hospital getting exposed, you know, to COVID. Dr. Isaac Bogosh says while it's overwhelmingly the unvaccinated who are getting sick and dying from the illness, there's room to expand the third dose rollout. I think we should really be expanding the community dwelling population to, you know, for example, 50 years up uh, would be a very reasonable thing. Ontario is among the provinces with plans to roll out boosters for all adults, but not until 2022. I think it would definitely give us more peace of mind, not just for Ryan's health uh, himself personally, but also to know like if there was others that are also receiving their third dose, it's just extra security. And better protection for those who are more at risk. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. COVID has strained Canada's healthcare system, but an inaccurate diagnosis has put an Ontario mother under a more personal level of stress. 
She had to go to three hospitals and talk to six doctors before getting the correct diagnosis for her baby. Diane Buckner has our Go Public investigation. Little Ozer Mohammed is just one year old, but has already had a frightening medical experience. Ozer was just crawling on the floor, but he ended up falling back and banging the back of his head on the floor. Very quickly, his parents realized something was wrong. His left side was not functioning at all. Um, his head was tilted to the left and um, his hand was actually just shut like this. The parents rushed Ozer to emergency at a nearby hospital. A doctor diagnosed a sprain and a cast was put on his arm. Two days later, his condition hadn't improved. And there was still no movement on his left side. They decided to take him to Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children. Again, a sprain or soft tissue injury was diagnosed. Ozer then saw a specialist here at Lake Ridge Hospital's Fracture Clinic, who also said the baby had suffered a sprain. But Ozer had had a stroke, a blood clot in his brain, which was only discovered when his mother took him to a third hospital and he was finally given a CT scan. Doctors make mistakes. Like this emergency room else. doctor says research shows 10 to 15 percent of people arriving in an ER will be misdiagnosed. Sometimes an initial incorrect finding sticks. But they're actually inheriting thinking that may not have been correct in the first place. He doesn't know about the doctors in this case, but says overall the pandemic means more mistakes are inevitable. People are working extraordinarily hard. After being contacted by GoPublic, the hospitals that misdiagnosed Ozer contacted the family and apologized for their ordeal. Sick Kids said in a statement that the incidence of pediatric stroke is rare and that they will review the case as a potential teaching opportunity for the divisions of emergency medicine and neurology. After two and a half weeks at a rehab hospital, the little boy is almost all better. The fact that I had to go through that experience it made it so much worse. She's speaking out to encourage all patients to listen to their instincts and says it could save a life. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Phelpston, Ontario. If you have a story to share or a tip you'd like Go Public to look into, you can email them directly, gopublic at cbc.ca. Canada's separate system of military justice could see almost all cases turned over to civilians. CBC News has learned the idea is being seriously studied by the Liberal government as it manages the sexual misconduct scandal in the forces. And as Murray Brewster explains, it could be a major step beyond what other allied nations are doing. Thank you, sir. Defence Minister Anita Anand's debut in front of the international defence community signalled change is coming. My top priority as the Minister of National Defence is to build and oversee cultural change in the Canadian Armed Forces in a positive and enduring way. Anand recently ordered misconduct investigations move to the civilian justice system. And that may be just the beginning. CBC News has obtained documents that show a working group will now study the full or partial civilianization of the positions of Director of Military Prosecutions and Director of Defense Counsel Services, or Military Prosecutors and Defense Counsel more generally. This could see almost all cases move to the civilian system. It is profound. In an interview with CBC News, Anand says the study is tied to the ongoing review of military misconduct by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour. I am preparing the ground for us to be able to act quickly on the recommendations in final form from Madame Arbour. A previous review last spring found both military prosecutors and defense lawyers faced interference and badgering by commanding officers concerned about cases. What the Canadians have done is very, very different by moving it into the civilian sector. U.S. Republican Senator Joni Ernst, former military member and leading voice for misconduct legislation making its way through Washington, a bill that does not go as far as what Canada is considering. What the original bill does is separates the uh, prosecution outside of the chain of command. It would go to a special trained prosecutor. Other Western allies, such as the Dutch, have already dealt with military sexual misconduct, and even they have not gone as far as what Canada is proposing. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Halifax. Coming up, our Canadian exclusive interview with Adele. I had no time to choose.
On the heels of her fourth album, the singer gets personal about divorce in the public yeah. eye. It must be some weird to break up being famous. Well, yeah, a little bit like having to sort of announce that you're separating yeah. just because otherwise it would start looking like things are dodgy. Plus, Olympic officials make contact with China's tennis star who went missing after making sexual assault allegations against a high-ranking official. By some worry, she is still not safe. But first, the smog is so thick in India's capital, it's sending some people to hospital. For any sensitive parent, it's scary. You can't do much about it. What's to blame? Next. Two of the missionaries kidnapped over a month ago in Haiti have been released. Today, their Ohio-based organization announced the pair is safe and they're in good spirits. A group of 16 Americans and one Canadian was traveling outside of Port-au-Prince when they were taken by a Haitian gang. The group included five children. Kidnappings in the impoverished country are widespread and ransom demands are hefty. Few details about today's release have been given, including the nationalities of those who were freed. After an unexplained disappearance that began nearly three weeks ago, a Chinese tennis star, Peng Shuai, has reemerged. <laughs> Videos surfaced of her at a restaurant, then of signing autographs at a youth tournament. Peng Shuai then told members of the International Olympic Committee she'd simply been enjoying some privacy. But on November 2nd, she went online accusing a high-ranking Communist Party official of sexual assault. Her post disappeared within 30 minutes. Soon after, so did she. In China, online searches of the topic and international coverage were censored. In recent days, Washington revealed it was considering a boycott of the Beijing Olympics, and a lot of pressure came from the tennis world itself. We're definitely willing to pull our business and deal with all the complications that come with it. WTA is willing to pull out from China, I mean, with all the tournaments, unless this is resolved. I support it 100%. Hung may be back, but with no sign her allegation will be investigated. For the eighth consecutive day, pollution in New Delhi is well above what's considered safe. Officials have already taken drastic steps to tackle the smog, but as it continues to worsen, more restrictions could be coming. Salima Shivji is in the Indian capital. The water guns to beat back the smog are working overtime to little effect. Delhi has been smothered in a thick toxic haze for days on end. The air quality so bad, all schools have been shut indefinitely. Trucks can't enter the capital and construction work is paused for now. The city is even toying with the idea of a full pollution lockdown, forcing people to stay home. But it's a regular Sunday at this market with the effects of pollution everywhere. For any sensitive parent, it's scary. You can't do much about it. Hospitals are struggling to deal with the consequences on children, respiratory problems. There has been a three to four fold rise in their uh, number of visits to the hospital. Pollution season is not new to Delhi, the world's most polluted capital, an annual issue made worse in winter, when the colder air and lack of wind traps the toxic air over the city. It's fueled by a combination of car exhaust fumes, waste burning and industrial pollution that's turned the sacred Yamuna River into a toxic mess. This is poisonous foam formed out of industrial waste and sewage. And India's heavy reliance on coal is also to blame, a relationship that won't end anytime soon, leaving experts worried that scrambling for short-term solutions like a lockdown will lull authorities into brushing off long-term changes. But these are not magic bullets. You know, that you do this for a few days and the pollution gets fixed. It doesn't work like that. With some of the emergency measures to tackle the deadly pollution set to expire tonight, there are urgent calls that long-term solutions come in lockstep with the wider region, not just the capital city crippled by toxic air. Salima Shivji, CBC News, New Delhi. Next on The National, Adele releases another deeply personal album. So She speaks with the CBC's Tom Power about her breakup and having to explain it all to her son. 
That moment is important. You know, I, like the moment you find out that your parents are human. Imagine hearing that as a six-year-old. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> Our Canadian exclusive interview with Adele is next. That is the first single from Adele's new hotly anticipated album, 30, which was released on Friday. No question the British singer is one of the biggest stars in the world, but she's also one of the most private. In the six years since her last album, Adele has been out of the spotlight. During that time, she's dealt with crippling anxiety and a divorce, subjects she now explores in her new album. Tom Power, the host of CBC Radio's Q, sat down with Adele for a candid chat in this exclusive Canadian interview, they talked about her struggle with fame, motherhood, even her connection to Drake. Hi. Hi. Adele, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Well, um, I suppose I should start with congratulations. It's really a really great record. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's so personal and vulnerable and... Yeah. So how are you with it all? I'm good. I mean, I'm kind of settling back into it. You know, it's been like maybe like three weeks now since I've felt like it's all kicking off and stuff like that. At first, I was like exhausted and overwhelmed, a bit teary all the time. I don't know if I want to do it, but it was too late. So I just have to sort of get comfortable with it and ride it. Is the trepidation because it's so personal? I don't know. I don't like being famous. You know, and it's coming out of nowhere after so long, I know, makes it more of a big deal. So you think, really, I put a record out every year, but I also don't want to do that. Um, yeah, it's just hard to get used to, you know, um, everyone being talking about me again, really. Like, you know? It is a bit strange, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's really strange. It's yeah. not normal. No. It's really odd. It's not a normal way to live one's No, life. and I live very normally, like, you know, normally. So, normal, no, yeah, but yeah, it's, I'm getting used to it. It's okay. I suppose we should start with the song, the first song. Okay. Yeah. And why did you want that one to be the one? Well, I just thought it was a good um, indicator of what to expect lyrically from the rest of the album. It was the first song I wrote for the album, um, and I thought it was just the right tone to come back with in terms of clearly I'm not angry, you know, clearly I'm not as devastated as only being devastated like I was on the other records. It's a very calm record, easy on me. Like, you know, obviously it's talking about like things falling apart and stuff, but it's also very grown up. It's a very grown up way of sort of, you know, knocking down your life and having to have those very big conversations. There ain't no gold in this river that I've been washing my hands in forever. So it's sort of you having to sit down as two absolute grown ups and talk about how you're going to split your lives apart. Like, you know, it has to be, you know, you have to be respectful with each other, you have to be calm, otherwise nothing's ever going to get sorted out. And it's not a song about anyone hurting each other, it's a song about being like, it's just, we love each other so much, but it's not working. So the tone of it is, is, is kind, I think. I had no time to choose what I chose to do. I think a lot of people thought I was going to be an angry, divorced woman. Yeah. And so I thought that Easy On Me was a, was a good tone of being like, well, I'm not, so listen to my side. Jeez, you say it's hard, it's weird being famous. Yeah. It must be some weird to break up being famous. Well, yeah, a little bit, like having to sort of announce that you're separating yeah. just because otherwise it would start looking like things were dodgy if, you know, you didn't tell people and then a pat might, you know, catch you with someone else or whatever. It was, yeah, yeah it yeah. was very strange, but... I feel like we navigated it quite well, considering. Now, I wanted to ask you about a song on the record, but I, I want to be gentle about it because okay. I'm not in the business of getting you to talk about anything you don't want to mm -hmm. talk about. But I wanted to ask about the song uh, with you and your son in it. My Little Love, yes. My Little Love. My little love I see your eyes Wide and like an ocean It's a song punctuated by like recorded conversations, yeah, yeah, between you and your son. Mm -hmm. Tell me you love me. I love you a million percent. And then it ends with sort of um, you speaking personally. Yeah, it's a voicemail that I left with my best friend. Yeah. Tell me about the decision to put those recordings on the song. Well, I thought it was um, important to like really kind of captures people's attention with that song. I think that is a really powerful song. 
Um, so I, to really, you know, get their attention, I knew that the voice notes would very much do that. Like, you know, and also to take them on a journey with my child as well, with the discussions that we're having in it. Like, the first time he, you hear his voice, he says, I love you, you know, I love you a billion percent. And so everyone's like, oh, like, you know, but then by the end, like, he's sort of being like, I feel like you don't like me. Like, you know, so it's going on his journey as well as my own, I thought was really important, made it more personal. I thought it'd be nice at this stage in my career also to, like, let people in a little bit more, you know, because I don't share very much of my life. I normally only really share my music, you know. I feel like today is the first day since... I left him I feel lonely. And at the end, with the voicemail that I included, that night I'd put Angelo to bed when I'd recorded that, and we'd actually had a really good bedtime and stuff like that, and afterwards just completely fell apart. And I'm not, not ashamed of that, like, you know, and I think a lot of parents hide things from their kids, as we should, you know, in most cases, but I couldn't hide from him. He could see me even clearer if I tried to hide from him, like, you know, so... Um, and it's actually, I've actually found that it affects men more than women. Um, like, people that I've played it to or that have heard it. The women are like, God, I, yeah, I feel like that a lot of the time. I feel like I'm struggling my motherhood, whereas I feel like the men I've played it to have never considered how their mum might have felt outside of being their mum. And it seems to really, really touch them, um, which is great, really, because I wrote it for Angelo, you know, and I wrote it to, to shine some light on, like, I didn't always have it together and stuff like that. But it was an important part of the puzzle I was trying to figure out, you know, my life, not the, not the album. Um, so I had to include it. That moment is important. You know, I, like, the moment you find out that your parents are human. Well, that's the thing. In the song, when, when I say, I don't really know what I'm doing, it, imagine hearing that as a six-year-old. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, you'd panic and your whole world would implode. But, you know, I was just trying to be clear with him and just, you know, and just be honest with him. But, you know, it was, it was intense. It was very, very intense, for sure. I did definitely by making that song, it it sorted out some of the clutter that was going on in my ability to talk about how I was feeling, you know. So the only way I could access how I was actually feeling was was by doing my music. Like I didn't even want to wash my hair. I didn't want to get up one morning, like you know, many mornings. Like I wouldn't go to my friend's like anniversary party. Like I had no desire to go and do any of those things, but I wanted to go and do my music. You know, it was reliable and it was consistent and stuff like that for me. And I knew that I could work through my personal issues if I was just near a studio. You know, didn't mean that other people had to hear it necessarily. But as I was like making the record for longer and longer, I realised I was really making progress, like emotionally. And I had a story to tell with that with the songs, which might help other people that either need to start doing the hard work on themselves or people that might never ever do it, but can, it can give them comfort by listening to someone else trying their hardest to get through the process, you know. But, I, you know, I've got my little mountain that I climb. That's what my What's tattoo... It's a, it's a mountain. It's just... I feel like I'm always on a mountain. Is that, right, is that a tattoo? Right now. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the stamp they gave you to get ah! in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right now I'm having a leisurely walk down here, but soon there'll be another bloody mountain. So yeah. it's like I need to learn what the tools are, you know, to make my climb up a mountain, up the next mountain easier each time, like, you know, so... This album, I think, isn't just about my relationship with my family. It's mainly about the relationship I have with myself which hasn't been a great one for most of my life so far. And I have to have a great relationship with myself to have good relationships with other people. And um, music is there for that reason. It's there for us to feel less alone. So I try and tap into that because that's the kind of music that I listen to. I guess it leads to the question I had about... Um, Drake put up this thing and he was like, I'm so proud of my best friend, oh, yeah. right? which was lovely. Yeah. You know, I know you don't like to think about yourself as famous, but you are. Yeah. And he is. What I thought was meaningful about that was you're in such a rarefied place in culture. Right. He is able to understand what you're going through. And so I thought that... But that's the whole reason that we're such good friends. Yeah. Is, like, having access to someone else that knows exactly what it's like to be in a, in a certain position sometimes. If I try and talk to one of my other friends about it, they'll be like, no idea what I'm talking about. They'll be like, I can't relate. Like, you know, so they just switch off. Just, I can say something to him and he won't judge me for it. You know, in terms, in terms of work or whatever, like, you know, and whereas other people might think I'm moaning. Like, you know, so to have access to someone that's in the same position as you is, like, one of the biggest gifts of, of my entire career. I got the rap. I'm like, can I ask you one more? Yeah. It's been lovely to talk to you. Is that it? Well, we don't have to be, but I got the rap. I Let's got ask the... a few more questions. Let's a have few, a guess. Just a few more. I'm having a great can, time. Can we bring in a bar cart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you hear when you hear this record back now, after all this time? I think just hindsight, 
I don't know hindsight of what, but like during it, it didn't feel like I was making any progress or learning any lessons. Um, when I listened to it at the end, and I had so long to listen to it because the last song I wrote for it was Hold On, which was a week before lockdown. So then I had to sit with this bloody record for a whole year. And I just, I realised in it that all the, all the t inner turmoil that I was going through, and I spent a lot of time on my own in 2019, like, you know, just at home. And um, yeah. hearing my friends in 2020 tell me what they were going through and stuff like that and being forced to sort of look inwards because they had no one else to look at, <laughs> mainly, like, you know, because they'd be on their own. Yeah. I was like, actually, I feel like the process that I just went through might actually be, be quite helpful. You know, and everyone needs a soundtrack, you know? Every, every day of life needs a soundtrack. So if anyone wants to listen to my album and it helped them on their journey, then great. Hi, God, it's been lovely to meet you. Really, really nice to meet you. Great interview, thank you. Uh, thank we, you so really much, lovely, our chat. lovely to thank meet you. Thank you very much, thank you. Now, can we start recording? Ah! <laughs> there was more, by the way, and you can hear that on the Q Interview podcast on the CBC Listen app. Next, a community devastated by floods comes together. They walked in with a backpack. I mean, and I realized that, that's all they had time for. We'll show you the people who open their doors to strangers in need. Stay with us. One week into BC's flooding crisis, there's still so much work ahead. Homes and farms underwater, some critical infrastructure like roads and bridges still totally unusable. The sheer scale of this relief effort is daunting. Amid the devastation, though, another tide is rising, the spirit of empathy and cooperation. Neighbor helping neighbor, many complete strangers with everything from food to fresh water to a place to stay. Nick Purden shows us how people have been pulling together. In the whole time I've lived here, I've never seen anything like this. Ellen Friesen has been watching the water for days. Out there, submerged, is the Sumas Prairie on the eastern edge of Abbotsford. The fact that we can see it unfold in front of us, out our window, that was, that was crazy. So many of our friends live on the Sumas Prairie. That's where we attend church, that's our community there, and that's who I was, that's who I was worried about. People like Erica McCauley. Erica's home is out there in what state she doesn't really know. As the water rose higher and higher, she and her husband, along with their three kids, were forced to abandon it. And at that point, um, we knew we had about 15 to 30 minutes to pack and go. Um, by the time we left, things were starting to rise faster, that, like we couldn't turn around. I just wanted to get the kids in the vehicle and get out. I was more frightened than I thought I would be. What were you frightened of? If you have children, everyone's worried about, that you'll lose your children. That night, Erica and her family slept on the floor of a McDonald's in a strip mall, completely surrounded by water. Okay. The next day when they were finally rescued, Ellen opened her doors to them. I was just thrilled that we got them here, um, but they walked in with a backpack. I mean, and I realized that that's all they had time for. I can cook for them, I can support them, and that I'm so glad we can do that. Do you know where our house is? Yeah. Yeah, straight Way ahead. Way out there. As a human being, if you have a heart, how could you not? I feel that this is the least I can do. Erica tells me she doesn't know what she would have done if Ellen hadn't helped her. This is the help we need. Mostly it just, it gives us a space to actually breathe and think things through. We've seen an incredible amount of people with huge heart. And I want our community to remain um, a united community that understands what it means to suffer together. <laughs> and that's the sense you get all over Abbotsford. That in a way, everyone has been affected by the floods. Take Jeff London and his friends. Their houses are safe and dry, but they're still here filling bags with sand. Do we work all day out in Surrey? And yeah. just down here helping out today. So you finished your regular job. Yeah. And then you came here to help out. Yeah. How come? People need it. Yeah, why not? One day maybe somebody will do it for me. And that's the thing. 
When a disaster strikes, we all wonder when it might hit us. Dean Reinprecht tells me that when the flood came, he had to do something. And now he's been here so long, he can barely lift his arms. It's been quite emotional, just people kind of driving by. And, and, and a, a, a lady came by earlier and dropped off like 15 bags of lunch she made at home by herself. And like, just that alone just gets you so pumped. What does it do for you to help? It just feels way worse sitting at home and thinking that there was something I could have done. What it does for me is, um, yeah, all I can say is I'm just grateful. Yeah, it just makes me feel grateful to get the opportunity to help. Yeah. An opportunity to help is what everybody seems to want. Take a look at this place. It's non-stop, people bringing supplies to help those affected by the floods. How about pass the sauce? Alicia McCallum is the organizer. Somewhere? You see this room fill up and get emptied out into uh, trucks to go deliver to people and then within minutes filled up again. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. You're smiling in the middle of a disaster. Oh, it, because of this, this has brought so much hope. Um, and just to see a community rally together when there's such a need, um, it brings, it, yeah, it, it brings a smile to my face to see how much people care about other people. Belle Thielman tells me she couldn't imagine being anywhere else today. My kids ditched school today to come here because I think it's just really important for, um, I want to raise them to help people in the community instead of um, just worrying about themselves all the time. It's really important to me. I got to package a bunch of food for people and I learned that it's like better to give to people than to receive. I think I'll remember this day for years to come. For Felix's mom, being here is about more than food and supplies. For her, the town is sending a message to those who need help. It's going to show them that they do have people behind them, even though they may feel alone, that they've lost everything, that there are people here that care for them and just want, want the best for them, want to help them. The flood brought destruction and despair here, but it also brought out the reality that to make it past all that, people have to fight together. Seeing the sun today, uh, is hopeful, is like, okay, this is a break, this is good. I hope that when this is finished, I hope that as a community, as a city, that we won't forget this, that we will be more empathetic, that we will be kind people after this. Even when the water is gone, like I hope that we will, we will remember. Nick Purden, CBC News. Abbotsford, British Columbia. It was nice seeing the sun today. We really needed that. Next to Toronto designers making a big difference in kids' lives with a simple pair of mittens. A little kid was super chill. She's like, I don't have a thumb. I don't need a thumb. Her inclusive adaptive clothing is our moment. Stay with us. Anna Maria Mountford is a clothing designer in Toronto who's discovered that fashion can do more than make people look good. It can help make them feel confident as well. Part of her business has become making mittens for kids, some who have limb differences. And her story is our moment. I got a random message on Facebook from a grandmother in the United States. Her granddaughter was born without fingers on her left hand. She chose her design and I said, does she want a thumb? She didn't have a thumb. And the little kid was super chill. She's like, I don't have a thumb. I don't need a thumb. If you could make me a mitten that doesn't have a thumb and that's really warm, that'd be great. And that's how it started. <laughs> but it was that one message that showed me the need and the size of the community just like rocked my heart because I was like, wow, I have purpose. Inclusivity is important. I think accessibility is important. And I wanted to make something that was like, you know, just like, thank you for seeing me. As a designer, she learned some practical lessons as well, using wicking material, for example, so that prosthetic limbs wouldn't get too wet, and also the fact that a good snug custom fit actually made people warmer. But at the end of the day, it was also making people who are different feel special. Mission accomplished. That is the National for November the 21st. Good night.